Hello, everybody. We welcome you back to Bar Nola for another episode of the Labatt Coaches Show. Dylan Clark alongside head coach of the Thunderbirds, Garrett Rutledge, and general manager of the Thunderbirds, Kelly Curl. Guys, thanks, as always, for being here with us. Always like doing the show here uh, on location at Barnola. Um, a weekend in Port Huron, some ups and some downs. Uh, but before we get into that, how's everybody doing? I'm doing wonderful. Back in uh, lovely Winston-Salem, some good weather finally, so it's nice. Kelly? Yeah, I was not happy getting off the bus in minus 7 in Port Huron, I can tell you that. Two feet so of snow. I was over that for sure. Well, then, I mean, it, you, you do realize, or it makes you realize how spoiled we are back here. Because especially not this past weekend, but the weekend before, we got back here. It was 61, 65 or something when I stepped off the bus. Oh, that was nice. I could get used to that. And that's kind of how it's been the last couple of weekends here. So it's just been, it's, it's been a nice little added bonus over the, the last little it bit. certainly has, Dylan. <laughs> so as we start the show here, I think we'll change up the order of things a little bit because uh, the league released its playoff format. Um, uh, it was the week, I guess, right before we left uh, for Port Huron this past weekend. And it's kind of changed things up. So instead of the four-team playoffs, six-team field, first two seeds get a bye through the first round, and the number three-seeded team gets to pick its opponent for the first round. And I, I just kind of wanted to hear uh, some of your thoughts about that because it's very different, I think, than anything uh, that we've seen here before. Yeah, I think our league's pretty tight, though. Actually, like Delaware's improved quite a bit. Every team, uh, as you can see, is beatable every single night. It doesn't matter what place you're in. So if you don't come to play in this league, it's one of those uh, leagues that uh, you can't take any team lightly, um, even on the road or at home. Everybody has kind of their home road rosters and guys they add in and uh, helps them out. So it's one of those things when you're picking an opponent, I guess, you're watching video and stuff, teams you've had success against. And uh, like I said, it'll come down. Kelly and I obviously will be working together on that and uh, going back, watching our games back and how we played. So it'll be uh, it'll be a tough process because I don't think anybody's really an easy opponent, to be honest with you. So Is it one of those things where you kind of look at the season as a whole? If it does get to a, a scenario where you get to pick your opponent, is it do you look at the season as a whole or do you put more emphasis on – matchups with that team that are more recent like you weigh february march matchups against them yeah really yeah i would say absolutely how you've done after christmas and stuff and once your final roster has been on there and stuff and how you match up pound for pound with the team so i think it's a fun fun little uh thing the league's put together i think the sp's done it and actually i think major league baseball is actually talking about doing it so i think it's kind of cool that uh like i said it's uh gives the other team a little bit of motivation when you get selected to play a team so and definitely travel comes into play on that so Absolutely. Kelly, your thoughts on the, the new playoff format for this year? No, I think it's definitely going to make things interesting, especially when you look at coming down the stretch and you start talking about the player roster turnover. I mean, it's like Garrett said, we're really going to have to evaluate the last month of the season as much as we can, which makes that tough when you haven't seen somebody like Watertown since then. And, you know, like we're not going to see Port Huron back up in their building. So it's going to make things a little more interesting as we try and navigate that decision process. There are a lot of things that teams will have to consider, a lot of what you mentioned, Garrett, uh, travel being one of them, and just kind of the way it is, there are kind of like the six teams that are all decently close together up in the north, and then there's Carolina and Columbus are kind of out of things. If, if one of those teams is in a position to pick someone, how much do you think travel factors into their decision? And, I mean, I'm asking you specifically because, you know, your job is so much of taking account into the travel and stuff like that, the things that not everybody really thinks of. Yeah, I think, I think a team like Columbus, especially being as far south as they are, if they're sitting in that third spot, they're really going to want to navigate which team they select. Uh, and, and you would have to imagine it would be us, almost no matter what the scenario, because they're going to look for that shorter travel turnaround versus maybe having to open on the road or close on the road. You know, it, it definitely gives you a little bit of an advantage when the travel is short. And it kind of... It doesn't change the target because obviously, I mean, the goal is to make the playoffs and to finish as high as possible to get the favorable, to get home ice advantage, at least in a traditional playoff system. But now there are kind of like, there are two different targets that you can kind of hit where it's like, okay, if you don't make the top two seeds, you don't get that first round bye week, you can still target that third seed. And it's like, okay, well, there's still a bonus to that because you would get to pick an opponent there. So is it something where, I mean, you've kind of had to, I don't know how much you've talked to the guys about it, but it's like, have you kind of talked to there are different levels and different levels of targets that you can kind of aim for in this uh, this postseason seeding? To be honest with you, I haven't even looked at the playoff seeding, to be honest with you. We're just worrying week to week and putting wins together. So right now we don't even have to worry about it, to be honest. So we got to concentrate on putting the wins together and everything will fall into place. And when that time comes, we'll be making the decision who we're going to play. So like I said, you got to go through the team eventually. So it doesn't really matter who you're going to pick, to be honest with you. So you got to play them at some point if you're going to win the championship. So at the end of the day, our guys will be ready and we'll play whoever we draw. 
you mentioned uh, the SPHL doing the seedings like that at one point. Uh, the Ice Hockey League in Austria, one of the leagues that did it as well, kind of the pick your poison. And as we kind of get into that, we use that as a segue. Uh, Mark Compain, defenseman out of Austria, signed before the Sunday game against Port Huron. 180 games in the Alps HL. 26 games with the Vienna Capitals this past season uh, before he came over here. And you kind of talked a little bit, Kelly, about when Mark walked into the locker room Sunday before the game. You could tell this guy was a hockey player just kind of the way he walked into a, into a room. Yeah, he, he definitely has a swagger about him. You know, he's, he's a European guy. You know, he, he, gets, he gets the fundamentals of hockey very well. You know, we, we got to see, I think, only about half of what Mark has to offer after traveling for 22 hours around the world, right? So I think once he settles in here for a week and he can kind of dial in, I think we're going to see a different animal. That's, I mean, we thought we had rough travel. And when I was talking to him about getting off that plane and that much, I mean, that was, uh, that was impressive to be able to come off and, and play not too long after. A, a he long flew first like class, just so you know. Well, like, still, I mean, mm, it's not that. Probably okay. had a bed laid okay. out. Of it, so. <laughs> All right, first class on a plane, a little bit better than, uh, than the, the bus seats. But still, it's like it's, you're sitting or laying down for 20 hours. I know. He has a family member that works on the airline that he flew on. So that's how, well, he, there you go. That's how he was set up with that. So Maybe we should get one of those. No, we'll see. Um, but, Mark, again, in, in one, one game so far, he kind of played a lot with, uh, with Jarrett Meyer, kind of became that top defensive pairing. And, and just, you know, Garrett, I'll ask you, just some of your initial thoughts off of a very limited sample size. Well, yeah, I, 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 I didn't like the start, that's for sure. It's definitely, it's one of those plays, but you can see his hockey IQ. you got to remember he comes from a big ice surface too, so there's probably like probably four feet extra in the European where he's used to playing behind the net and stuff. And I think, I don't know how much wider it would be. It's probably like, I don't know, six feet maybe wider. So it makes a big difference in your timing and stuff like that and coming to a different league, playing with different players, different styles and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a work in progress. I know he's excited to be here. He's watched a lot on YouTube and stuff, and he speaks very highly of, of our fan base and our arena and how much fun it looks. So he looks to be uh, very excited to be in Carolina, and it's a pleasure to have him. So I encourage the fans to say hello to him because he speaks very good English, and he's a very well-mannered kid, and uh, he looks like a pro, and he's going to be fun to watch in a Thunderbird jersey. With other European players coming over in the past, you, you mentioned the difference in the size of the sheet. It's obviously a, you have to change your game. You have to change the way you look at things and think about things. But how long kind of typically does it take, do you think, with players you talk to to really get comfortable with that? I don't think it takes that long. If you're a high hockey IQ, you have a lot of skill and stuff. They adapt pretty quick to the game. It's just, just the just the pace of the play and, and where guys are on the ice. I don't know. It's it's one of those things. They they adapt pretty quick. It's just hockey at the end of the day. You don't overthink it. You just go out there and play. Right. And Mark, one of those players, you talk about families with – Lots of hockey pedigree. Uh, his brother played professionally uh, in Switzerland. Father Gert, a four-time Austrian champion, um, skated at the 88 Olympics uh, in Calgary with Austria. And it's just one of those things that kind of pops out at you right away. Like, not only is he a hockey player when he walks in, the way he carries himself, but he comes from a hockey family and he's surrounded by uh, that high-level hockey atmosphere all the time. And I guess just how much of a how much of an advantage is that when you get to grow up in a house like that with your dad being an Austrian national player? I, th I think it changes how you carry yourself at the rink, right? He got to see from a professional standpoint how to be around the room and how to be around the rink. And we're really hoping that's something that he'll bring to some of the younger guys on the team here is that, that sense of professionalism. Um, that's something that the vets have to teach the younger guys. And you know, we, we anticipate that'll be one of his strengths here. Mark Compain, the newest defenseman signed just this past weekend. We expect to see a lot more of him over the next few weekends. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here on the Labatt Coaches Show. When we come back after word from our sponsors, we'll get into the weekend that was against the Port Huron Prowlers. Whether you're a Division I athlete, an avid runner, or just someone who likes to move, you deserve the expert care of the region's most experienced sports medicine team. We're the official health provider for over 35 pro, collegiate, and youth sports organizations. We offer same and next day appointments, and our goal is to get you back to your game and keep you active. If you want to finish strong, start here. Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist. Welcome back to Barnola for this week's episode of the Labatt Coaches Show. Dylan Clark with Garrett Rutledge and Kelly Curl. Uh, the Thunderbirds headed back up to Port Huron to finish off five straight games against the Prowlers. We talked about kind of that uh, mid-season playoff series feel. Um, won one out of the three games on the weekend, but when you kind of take a step back, three out of the five, if it were a playoff series, it, 
the Thunderbirds would have advanced on to the next round. So when you kind of take a step back and look at not just this past weekend, but the weekend before as a whole, what kind of positives are you able to take from that? Well, I'd like to have three wins this weekend, to be honest with you. So it was, uh, it's still a learning curve for our group. We still got a young group. We probably have one of the younger teams in the league. So it's credit to our guys. They still got to learn how to travel day of or the night before and kind of get off the bus and get that mental side of things and be prepared. So I want to see them stick into the game plan a little bit more, playing playing a good, solid road game instead of a little wide open. So um, I don't know. It was, uh, it was kind of 50-50 for me. I wasn't all that happy with the weekend, to be honest with you. So I thought we should have got all three, to be honest with you. And, and I set our bar pretty high after the previous weekend playing Port Huron. So I think we let two slip away on us. But it is what it is, and hopefully the boys learn from it and, and learn that any team on any given night can, uh, can beat you. So you need to come prepared, and you need to put the work in the first five, ten minutes of the game and be ready to play. Those that first five ten minutes of the game seemed to be a, a bit of a difficult point or a difficult spot in the game on the weekend. Uh, five one loss starting out Friday night, three nothing down early in the game, and then Blake Peavy's goal, a deflection from the point, seemed to turn things. Not only because okay now you're on the scoreboard, but there was an immediate change, or at least I could see it from my spot. There was an immediate change in the way the, the team was reacting and interacting with one another. And I just wanted to see if if you could notice the same thing down on the bench. Yeah, the, the energy definitely changed. The, the hard part about it was it changed when it did. We, we really needed that start or that jump a little bit earlier in the game just to get everybody's blood flowing and get the energy going. It's, it's one of those things where you, it's very difficult to teach a guy how to show up you know, and play right off the bus and, and, and be able to go. It's, and it's something, once again, this is where we go back to Mark coming in as a pro and the other guys we've got that are vets here, like trying to teach those habits and mannerisms like – You've really got to work hard to get yourself dialed in early. And, uh, you know, it was just a little bit too late for us on the weekend. But there was definitely an energy shift. Guys were more engaged. That was probably our best 10 minutes of hockey that followed. And it just takes time. Blake Peavy with a deflection goal there. And we've kind of talked about him more and more as the season's gone on. He, he plays important minutes. And I can't remember who I was talking to about it. But he understands his role within the team. He understands what he's good at. And he excels at that. I know he's a go-to guy for you in the face-off circle. He's got five points in his last six games. Just what can you say about Blake Peavy's game to this point in the season and especially over the last couple of weekends? Blake Peavy's one of those guys you uh, you always want on your hockey team. So when you're a coach, you look down, he's always – number 27 is always there. And when he's not in the lineup, and he hasn't been for us, he's always been there. I know he was suspended there, but he's always a guy that you just kind of – you know he's there. You always use him. You can use him any spot. You can put on wing, penalty kill, power play, defensive zone draws. Whenever you need something, Blake Peavy is always the guy that comes to mind. So he's a pleasure to have, and he's one of the older guys in the team. So he's uh, been through the ringer a bit. He's played Elmira and all these different places and had success. So um, definitely a pro. So it's great to see him having success. And guys like him tend to up their game after Christmas. And closer it gets to playoffs, he uh, ups his level of play. Following that loss, uh, 5-1 Friday, Something we're not used to seeing here, uh, a 2-1 win on Saturday, the lowest scoring game of the season uh, for the Thunderbirds thus far. And it was just, I mean, it's, it's out of the ordinary, but I, I guess the question is, why is it out of the ordinary that you see such a low scoring game? Because, I mean, it's 5-4 is a pretty normal score, um, at least the way things have gone recently. Why, why does 2-1 seem a little more surprising? So uh, that game for us was, was a growth game, I think. Uh, when you go back and look at it, like we, we tried to adjust how we were playing against Port Huron, who was playing fast on a small sheet. We tried to run a little bit of a different, different style of forecheck and neutral ice, and, and the guys adapted and they worked hard and, and they were able to get through it. Um, you know, but as, as far as that goes, the, the two win aspect of it being a tight game, I think, was something that we needed to play. We needed to learn how to win it. And as far as it being out of the ordinary, I, I think as the season winds down and the hockey gets better and we start getting closer to playoffs, you're going to see a lot more of those games. You're going to see a lot more teams kind of well rounding out their back end, locking in their, for, their front end, and you're going to see teams playing a lot closer games as we move down the stretch. Jarrett Meyer uh, able to open the scoring for the Thunderbirds that weekend, or, or uh, that night, I should say, Saturday night. Um, five points so far in his, uh, his brief stint as a Thunderbirds. You notice him right away because of his size and the way he plays, but uh, his scoring touch is becoming hard to ignore at this point. And it's just, it's one of those things, uh, was that, were you expecting kind of this level of production early on from him? Yeah, absolutely. It's no surprise. Kelly and I both brought him in for a reason and the level of play he's played. So he's got a quick release. He's always in the right spot. And it, I don't think it could matter if he was four feet. So 
Um, he's a good hockey player. He's got a good hockey IQ. And when you have heart and desire and, and want to be a student of the game, you're going to have success. So he gets a shot off. He gets to the right areas. And it's, and it's great to see him having success. So hopefully our defensemen can learn from him and other guys in the team that you don't have to score the pretty goals all the time. You can set yourself up into positions and attack the net. It was one of those plays you could kind of tell he had his mind made up from the second, even before he got the puck, that he was taking that to the net no matter what, picking up the rebound. And I guess is that one of those things where, I mean, every place you go, every team you go to, every league you change into or out of, the, the style of play is going to be different. So I guess the question for him coming in uh, out of the OHL is the adjustment time, I guess, how you learning how you have to play or how you're able to play uh, in the FPHL. And, and is it becoming more apparent to him that, kind of a straight line game right to the net in some cases uh, is going to be the best situation for him? Well, I think he's the type of guy, he's just going to take advantage of the ice that's given. I mean, he takes up so much of it at one time, you know, and I think Garrett said it best. He's a guy with the skill and the IQ to be able to do that. The fact that those were kind of straight line plays and just hard work plays, I don't think that's necessarily him learning how to play in the league. I think that's just him being him. You know, I, I think as we go on and teams give him or don't give him space, he'll adapt. I think he'll figure it out and he'll go. I mean, we have to remember Jared came out of college here at Planet Laurentian where he had a few months off. I mean, he didn't get to play for a while, and he's refinding his game and his footwork and his hands. And I mean, you see him make some mistakes here and there, but he's adapting and growing. And he's a guy that I think you, you don't see him make the same mistake twice, right? Like if he does something, he makes an adjustment. If he does something well, he continues to do that well. I think, I think it's just going to be a matter of time for him. He's just going to be better and better every time we watch him play. You talked about it's just him being him, him playing the way he's most comfortable. Is that something that some players kind of struggle to get to that point? Um, not be, or thinking that they have to play a little bit differently or not themselves uh, to have success. Oh, yeah. Some players absolutely have that issue. It doesn't matter what level. They, they lose their identity. Like, guys that – like, it's the same old analogy. If you're a coach and you have a checking guy, you can't expect him to come in and score 30 goals. Like, some guys, if he's a skill guy, he can't be parked on the third or fourth line on a hockey team. He's got to play in those, in those areas where he's going to succeed. And that's kind of like how Gus Ford – like, he's got to be able to play those skill minutes and stuff. Like, yeah, he's not going to smash into people and put them through the wall and all that kind of game he has obviously sometimes you have to take the good with the bad but what he does when the puck's on his stick it's the same as Jared so um, credit to our guys even our ozone like we all activate in the ozone and we create chaos and that allows Jared and other defensemen to join into the offense and have some fun and enjoy the game of hockey so I'm not a big proponent of sitting back anymore and 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 having 2d sitting on the blue line like it's just a role replacement kind of thing so if the d go down the forward better replace him so it's all work in progress but it's fun to see guys actually starting to do this and having success with it. And then uh, Brandon Rossi that Saturday night in the 2-1 win, 26 saves on 27 shots. And we talked after the game about not, not just the, the body of work as a whole, but the saves he was making were timely and, and how much those timely saves uh, can dictate the course of a hockey game. Absolutely. Like that's the big thing about playing net. It's just uh, you don't have to make all of them. You just got to make the right saves at the right key times. And the team seemed to build off it and be blocking shots and stuff. And Rozzy was feeling it. So it was, it was great to see him have success again in on the road for us. So um, like I said, I can't be more prouder for him and uh, just keep having success. So after that win on Saturday night, um, things kind of revert back a little bit. They were Friday night. And I guess the, the most curious thing about Sunday and the way that it started was allowing a quick goal right off the bat there in the first period. And I know that's things happen. Things happen. But just to have it happen not only in the first period but the second period as well, I just it's, it's not something you see every day. And, you know, that's for, for a good reason. So I, I guess just is it something where players are thinking too far ahead and not taking care of what's right in front of them before it actually gets there? Well, one, one of the things that, you know, I, I try to talk about, you know, with the guys is keeping things simple, right? Sometimes you, you want to make a play that's not necessary, um, you know, and I, I think both situations we tried to force a play that we might not have had to. And that's, that happens with guys that have skill and it happens with guys that, you know, that have that ability because they can do it one time and get away with it, and they go to do it a second time, and it doesn't go the way they wanted it to, right? And, and you know, I think that was one of those where – it's a great example, reverting back to Meyer, right? Like, he went to go to his backhand to make a play, mishandle a puck, right? Didn't go back to his backhand the rest of the game. Like, he kept it on his forehand every time he moved it the rest of that game. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of those where it's, it's learning curves and, you know, kind of having to bear down in that first minute and last minute of every period just makes things a little tougher. 
Was it kind of a, a similar feeling on the bench Sunday when you compare it to Friday? Down 3 nothing, starting to come back in, and the surge seemed to be a little bit more than it was on Friday. It still fell just a little bit short, but was it a similar feeling like, hey, wait a minute, we've been here before? Yeah, I mean, we. here's the thing. We're no stranger to playing from behind, right? I think Garrett has done a good job of keeping our guys kind of focused and keeping them on the mission. And some days it goes your way, some days it doesn't, you know. We, we had a couple of guys that, you know, didn't feel their best. You know, obviously we were missing Dawson Baker out of the lineup on Sunday, and you know, and, and Dawson's one of those guys that the way he controls the puck up and down the boards is crucial throughout the course of a game, right? So when you miss a piece like that, it changes the dynamic of how that, the flow of that game's going to go. And, uh, you know, I think it's just it's one more growing piece for us. Like, I, I hate to keep saying that we have to grow and we have to grow, but, I mean, I think the concept of a hockey team throughout the course of a season is that you're constantly getting better at the things you weren't doing well early on. And, um, you know, I think it's just it's one of those how it goes. Well, that's that getting better at things you weren't good at early on. That's perfect because I, I did want to take a second to talk about um, the, the penalty kill. 12 out of 13 penalties killed on the weekend, and that was uh, not a strong spot at the beginning of the season. Uh, the, the team was sixth or seventh in the league on the penalty kill for the longest time. 82% now, second in the FPHL. What's changed? to really have the penalty kill become a source of strength for you guys over the last little while? Well, right away, I think goaltending. It's, uh, that's number one thing about the penalty kill is you got to have good goaltending. So credit to our goalies keeping us in there, and credit to maybe picking up Meyer. He's six foot nine, like He's got a big reach and stuff like that. But Tommy Cardinal and John Batita and, and these guys that go up, Blake Peavy and Schnapp and that, you see these guys laying on the line every night for us, blocking shots, putting their body in front of the pucks and stuff. So it's great to see, and that just that just breeds like, like to the compete level and the – and the killing of the penalty. So I have this feeling now that going forward, it's great to see, and it's great to see our team building, and, and it's going to be good. So we got to have a good penalty kill to win. So you're going to get take penalties in this league. So it is what it is, but it's great to see if it's had success. We'll take it. You talked about Tommy Cardinal there and his coming back from suspension in the Saturday night game, probably a big part of winning that game. He scores the game-winning goal, and it was just apparent right away he gets plugged back in on the top line with Gus Ford and John yep. Batita, and it's just – all three of them together, the second they're reunited, it, it seems like they're most comfortable when they play with each other. Yeah, he's a big aspect to our, to our team, really. Like, so Tommy plays kind of whatever game you want to play. He's a, a component of uh, he'll do it. So if you want to throw him down, he'll throw the gloves down with you. If you want to score goals, he'll score goals. He'll hang around the net. He kills penalties. He's a big part of our hockey team. So it's a pleasure to have him. He had four games rest there, so he come a uh, shot out of a cannon. So it was good to see him out there having success. And like I said, I'm looking – going forward this, this line's uh all year been huge for us so it's great to see tommy head doing it kelly you, you've gotten to see uh more of tommy cardinal at least in person uh, than garrett or i had just because he's been here for a few near a few years now and what can you say about the growth of his game because he wasn't scoring as often or, or setting up as many plays uh in the past but now he seemed to find a scoring touch to kind of go along with the physical part of his game just what can you say about his growth over the last few seasons uh, I mean, immediately you have to think about Gus Ford, right? So Tommy's playing on a line with a very, very skilled hockey player. And when, when Tommy works hard to get to the right areas, a player like Gus Ford makes it easy for you to put pucks in the net. I mean, you talk about a guy that creates space and timing. You know, Batito runs him down. Batito slips it to Ford. Ford now is looking actively towards the net, and Tommy's working hard to get there. And good things happen. I mean, it's – you don't get one without the other, right? Tommy's game didn't just dynamically get better overnight, but the circumstance in which he plays the game and how he plays it with the people around him just make him that much better. One more quick break here on the Labatt Coaches Show. That'll just about wrap up uh, the port here on discussion. When we come back, we'll get into the weekend series ahead. Columbus comes to town uh, this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So it's time for a new car, but where do you go? You could go here, or you could go here. Seriously? Nobody does that anymore. We thought there has to be a better way to buy a car. Where you do it when you want, where you want, and how you want. So we made one. It's called Go Modern. We made it easy to choose a car you want. Pick your payment, apply for credit, even schedule home delivery. Or just do some of that and finish the rest at one of our 17 dealerships, the way you always have. Go Modern, the new way to experience the modern difference. Hey guys, hope you're enjoying this week's episode of The Coach's Show. 
thought we'd take a quick break to update you on what's going to be going on here at Barnola while the Thunderbirds are taking on the River Dragons this weekend. Uh, live music, drink specials all weekend long. Mardi Gras party this Saturday, the 26th. And on Fat Tuesday, a special collaboration with the Thunderbirds. We're going to get into a little bit more of that later on. Uh, we'll drop some hints on our social media in the coming hours here. But uh, they hope to see you here, and we hope to see you at the Annex this weekend. One last time here on the Labatt Coaches Show, Dylan Clark with you with Garrett Rutledge and Kelly Curl from Barnola. And we've gotten through the last weekend. We've gotten through uh, talking about the playoff format a little bit and the weekend ahead. I think it's been on everybody's schedules. It's been circled on their calendars for a little while. Three games in a row at home against the Columbus River Dragons. And uh, Garrett, this probably won't be a, a tough one for your team to get up for this weekend. No, it's absolutely. It's our rivals, I guess. I don't know. There's, every game's the same for me, but um, I know the fans around the little buzz in the arena when Columbus is coming to town or even when the Thunderbirds go to Columbus. So it'll be fun, and that's what hockey's all about, right? It's good for both clubs and good for our organization to get some good crowds and some good competitive hockey. So it should be fun, a good measuring stick for our hockey team. So I'm looking forward to the result this weekend. And the interesting thing about it is we've played – seven or eight games against the River Dragons so far this season. Only one of them has been at home, and that was all the way back in November. So it's been a long time since the Thunderbird fans have gotten to see Columbus come to town in a Carolina-Columbus matchup uh, in person. Uh, it's got to be something they're, uh, they're kind of foaming at the mouths to come and come back and see. Oh, yeah. Well, anytime Columbus comes in the building, it's exciting, right? We know that they bring a certain energy, and, you know, you're bringing back some, some fan favorites with, you know, Jay Krupp and Josh Petrantonio and – you know, those guys, when they come back into the building, everybody's excited to see them, you know, just as much as they are some of the guys that we have. And it's, you know, it's always a pleasure having, you know, Jeff Krupp and his ownership in the building. And, you know, it's exciting having, uh, you know, Barry uh, Soskin and Kerry um, Ross in the, in the building this weekend with our ownership group. And it just it goes to show what, you know, those guys as a whole have done for hockey in this area, right, to make something so exciting. Uh, you know, for our fans to be able to come see. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to have them in town. Garrett, it doesn't seem like it um, simply because time's just been going by so quickly, but it's been a month uh, since you guys have seen the River Dragons. Um, a three-game sweep on the road there. What kind of things are, are you going to be kind of pounding home this week uh, to remember um, that was something that went right last week and are things that were done well last time you saw them? Just competing every shift, looking after a defensive zone, just the regular old stuff the coach is going to say to you and stuff so like I said they're a good hockey team they can score some goals they can kind of play heavy they're hanging around the net and stuff um, like I said it's it's one of those things you got to stay disciplined you got to stay to the penalty box it's the same old analogy nothing really changes night in night out to play any team Dylan it's just you got to be ready to play play the right way and, and things will go your way eventually and as if uh, this was not going to be an exciting weekend enough as it already was uh, pucks and paws night on Saturday against the River Dragons, 6 o'clock start time. Bring the dogs to the Annex. Kelly, is there any chance that we see Bauer and or Tux at the fairgrounds this weekend? Oh, there's there's definitely a good chance we see Bauer running around at some point. Uh, she's she's the big boxer, so she's the big baby of the group. You know, likes the social interaction and that kind of stuff. So she'll she'll definitely be around some to make sure she says hello to everybody. And, you know, we'll, we'll have some fun. And it's, you know, it's a fun event. You know, uh, Hillsdale Animal Hospital and their entire staff will be there. So it'll be exciting to have, have them in the building. And, you know, it's uh, it's just a fun weekend. It's a fun event. And before, oh, you got something? Will a dog make an appearance on That's what I was going to ask. I was going to say, I'm like, I will, if it's okay with you, I'll bring Bauer on the broadcast. Why are you asking permission? Just do it. What's his dog? I'm not just going to say, hey, I'm taking your dog. Okay, well, it is what it is. Hey, I'm taking your dog on the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dylan. If I need to ask anybody, it would probably be Sam. That's, That's right. Yeah. So, uh, but before we do go, before we wrap up here, um, there are some questions that you guys wanted to ask. But I will open it up to questions before we shut it down because before we started filming, you guys said that there were questions you wanted to ask. I have questions, eh? Well, to start with, my biggest thing is we go to get a coffee and the play-by-play -play radio guy goes right to the front of the line. So right away, you got Max Fine and Kangaroo Court. I think it's tomorrow that you're going to be brought up in court in the dressing room. So you'll probably have a $10 fine for that one. So you went ahead of the whole team. Um, other than that, I forget. I think you ordered peppermint tea or some type that's of mocha not, You or know that's so not true. From Tim Hortons. It wasn't the regular coffee that Tim Hortons is known for. So it's kind of one of those things that 
your man card was kind of in violation. So um, it is what it is. I forget what else I was kind of on you about. I, I will hand up right away. Uh, yeah, going first, not the best idea. But the thing about it was we're trying to get in and get out before the game. And that's just the, that's just the way I was thinking because you, you were nice enough to hold the door for me. So I walked I was, right in yeah. and I was like, let's, let's just get her going. And then I just turn around and I see everyone behind me just max fine. Max fine. And I didn't even know because I that's I mean, this is my first year in pro hockey. If if not to make excuses, but that's hey, you're learning quick, I guess. So. <laughs> but other than that I forget what I was gonna get on you about, but it is what it is. I'm sure it'll come back up and we'll bring it back up. Oh, it'll later. it'll come back up as soon as the camera turns off, I think. Kelly, is there anything you had to add about that? So I think you should tell the people how much you nerded out when you got there to see Doc Emmerich's booth. And t- actually it's actually a great piece piece of history if you just want to touch on that for a second. Because it is, you know, I could imagine Sitting in, in an NHL player's stall, it's got to feel pretty similar when you're up there where Doc started his career, right? So yeah, my um, my parents got me Doc's book for Christmas last year or whatever. So I was reading about that, and he started his career with the Port Huron Flags in the IHL in the '70s, and that was the building that they played, and that was the building where he got his start. And I mean, if there's any broadcaster that everybody looks up to it's it's doc every every person in my position wants to be doc emmerich someday so uh to walk up the stairs and i, I remember it the first time that we did go up there in uh, in december i think just walking up the steps and getting to see like oh i get to call a game from the mike emmerich bro- uh, broadcast booth that's just it, it does it, it does make you feel uh, a certain way but uh, i did i managed to get a picture uh this time and you know i'm not like a, i'm not a big selfie guy but I, I did make sure I, I, got a, I got a picture in front of that because that's the last time we'll go up there uh, during the regular season. So I, I got a picture of that, and I, I sent it to my parents. Cause did I told you use any uh, Doc Emmerich lines or anything? Or no, I, I don't think so. I no? just I can't because I, I don't want to just steal stuff. Although uh, there were some words I had to work in that people suggested. Um, Catawampus was one of them. I throw that Yes, that is another thing. We've challenged Dylan. We've picked probably five or six words throughout a broadcast for him to throw in. and. I think I did. You get crocodile. In? I didn't get crocodile. I, uh, I, so if you do hear something odd come out, know that Dylan's working his best <laughs> to uh, get these in, and some of the players have given some words to put in. So if you uh, you hear something funny on there and he doesn't get it in there and it doesn't make sense, please let me know and it'll be addressed in court on uh, Wednesday and you'll be fine. <laughs> uh, please send your words to Dylan C at CarolinaThunderbirds dot com if you want a word added into the broadcast. Yes. Thank you for that. He's kidding, but that actually would be pretty funny. Yes, Dylan C at CarolinaThunderbirds.com. Uh, all of your word suggestions will be taken into consideration. And if I can fit them in, I will definitely try to do so. No, um, no, you're fitting them in. <laughs> well, well, there are some that I probably won't be able to fit in. Well, it has to be within reason. Within well, reason. Oh, yeah. well, see, I thought Crocodile was going to be easy, but I kind of. I'll try, I'll try again this weekend. I'll try again this weekend. Um, guys, thanks as always for the time. Uh, another solid coaches show. Thanks again to Barnola for hosting us. Um, that'll just about do it. We'll see you guys next week here when we return with another episode of the Lebac Coaches Show.